run there. At this point, I want to, in a sense, bring the whole communion study to a, a conclusion. But it's pretty hard to do that because there's so much more could be said. Uh, next week's Pentecost, uh, Dave speaking, is next week, isn't it? All being well, Dave speaking. That my discipling labour or anything, and it's. It is important that dad's there when it happens. <laughs> I think else he'll never live it down. So we'll, we'll take that as it comes. But three weeks ago we looked at the juice representing the blood and the power in the blood and how the blood has just cleansed and we are forgiven. Over the last two weeks, last week and the weeks before that, we looked at the body, the bread representing the body, the body broken. Now I could have got into John 6, but as we work our way through John, we'll cover that bit there. Um, and we looked at the healing power of God, how his body was broken to bring in, and it's great that we're hearing prayer, answers to prayer. And I was getting excited because when we were saying about Ian and the week before we had that, I told you about Ethan's situation. And um, we've got to be aware that God is in the prayer answering business. The only thing is that you've got to hear pray and that you've also got to believe and don't doubt. And there's a verse in John which we'll get to at some point, John 15, that looks at that. But it's interesting, um, you need words, so I don't know why I'm getting on this, but you need something from the Word of God to stand on. Now, for example, I was talking to Hope, and she started coughing a lot more, and we said, we, we'll pray for you. Uh, and she said, Dad, I'm praying. I said, okay, what you need to do, because I'm trying to, I'm trying to grow, I'm trying to educate her in the things of God. And I said to her, you need to get something from the Bible to stand on. She looked at me and said, you need a verse from the Bible that you can hold on to. And that I said, the Bible teaches us that we should remind God of what he says. Not that God forgets, it's just that we're simply standing on that. So I said to her, I said, why don't you read Psalm 103? Have a look at that and find out if there's a verse in there that you think I can hold on to. So she read through it and she came back to me and says, that is a verse. I said, which is it? She says, because it goes... Praise the Lord, oh my soul, not forget his benefits. And he goes, oh, it heals all our sickness. She said, Dad, this is a sickness, and I'm going to stand on that verse. And tonight when I pray, I'm going to remind God that he has said this, and he's true to his word. I said, go for it, Lord, go for it. She's got an asthma checkup in a couple of weeks, and I'm just not to say it. <laughs> it's all stopped. Because I don't want, I'm not praying that her symptoms stop. We're praying for healing in those situations. So that was the last couple of weeks. So today I just want to look at the table and remind ourselves of what it is. But ultimately the table reminds us of God's love for us. We sung a song about how we love God. But the table reminds us of how much God loves us. And the couple of things I really want to have, three things I want to just scan through is that we are loved. That love is costly and love is active. See, we are loved by God, and yet if I said to everybody, tell me something that's really important, they say, we need to love God. And yet that is important, that we do love God, and the song we sung is that we love God. And there's a, a guy who came to Jesus, you can read this in Mark 16, and he says this, the, the guy says to Jesus, which of the commandments is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is to hear all Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And that is a verse that often has been preached on for Christians and given to Christians, and it is something to aspire to. But the truth is, none of us has ever loved the Lord our God with all our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength. None of us have ever done that. And in the context of what's happening, this guy comes to us and says, which is the most important command? So Jesus said, okay, the greatest or most important command is that you love God with everything. But when Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't about what we do anymore, it's what he's done. You see, the law is all about you doing and then God does. But grace is all I have already done, therefore you can so he was saying, what is the greatest command? So Jesus said, well, the greatest command is that you love God with everything. 
And that's not a bad thing to aim for. But if you try to put your own strength, even when you should love him with all your strength, you're never going to get there. And often you can beat yourself up because I'm not loving Lord God, God with all my heart, mind, strength and soul. I'm not doing it good enough. The devil will beat you up about it. But the, the law is all about <coughs> you doing where grace is all about what Jesus has done. So for us, we love God because he loved us. In the Old Testament, under law, is we love God so that he can love us back. There's a difference. You see, in the Old Testament, is we do the right things and God will bless us. In the New Testament, is you are blessed, therefore go and do the right things. It sounds the same, but it's not the same. You're already blessed, therefore you can be a blessing. You can't earn it, it's just given, if you receive it. So when Jesus was asked that question, he says the command, the most important, is this. And yet that's still a command. But we've never done this. We've never done it all. We're, under, we're not under law, we're under grace, but we should still love God. I was just pointing out this morning to a picture that the kids are doing in the back. It's of the, of the Ark of the Covenant. And the kids are going to draw that. So I was just in, interested to know what they were going to be drawing or colouring in. Because I think sometimes we dwell too much on the, the Ten Commandments and the law when it comes to kids. And yet we're never told them, we're never told to say that to them, we're told to talk to them about the grace of God. And I'm just pointing out the fact that the Ark of the Covenant has in it, does anybody know what's in the Ark of the Covenant? You're not paying enough to just do all the work, so. Aaron staff, the Ten Commandment tablets, yes? And some manna, yes, and I'll just point out to Joe so what I've learned about that. God gave them manna because of people complaining about God's provision, so he gave them manna. So he said, put some in there. They complained at God's leadership. So he said, okay, line up, put your staff in. The one that buds is, is the one and it were air, and in fact it grew fruit, so they put that in. And also the law, they would complain and say, well, that's just stated. We can do everything God asks us to do. But he proudly so God said, okay, you try doing these ten. And put it in. And we always think that's what's in the Ark of the Covenant. But we forget the Ark of the Covenant is in two places, it's actually in two things together. There's a box, and that's the Ark of the Covenant. Covenant. But on top of it is the mercy seat. Mercy and grace covers everything. That's why. When they lifted it up to have a look in it, they were looking to the old ways, not the mercy on the top. They were looking at the law, not the mercy. I don't know why we're on that, but we'll get back to what we're at. Okay, if I said to you, you know, it's all about accepting God's love, so you've got to look at Yes, we have to love God, but at the end of the day, this is what it says in 1 John 10, sorry, 1 John 4, 10. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loves us and sent his son as a propitiation for our sins. It's not important that we love God, even though we would say that is important. What we need to realise is the more important thing than us loving God is the fact that God loves us. And when we understand how much God loves us, it changes everything. John the disciple in the Gospel of John is called the one who Jesus loved. It wasn't that God loved him more than anybody else. It's just that John knew he was loved. And therefore, he could love back. Where the other disciples were quite just accepting. In fact, Peter said, Now I love you, God, and I'll go to his grave with you. And then shortly, he's not legging it, he's running. John's the one who stood at the cross at the end. Because he understood he was loved. And loved amazingly. The message version puts it this way This is the kind of love that we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loves us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away the sins and the damage they have done in our relationship with God. It's not that we love God, but the fact that he loved us and gave his son. 1 John 3, 1 says this, See this kind of love that the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Love is being called a child of God. 
which is what we are. Do you know Jesus this morning? You are a child of God. You may not feel like a child of God. You may not sometimes want to be a child of God. But the truth is, if you've accepted Jesus, you are a child of God. And you are loved. You are beloved as well. Ephesians 2, 4 says this. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespass, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. There are loads of verses that talk about God's love, God's love, God's love, God's love. And yet there are people, and especially some Christians that I've come across, who say, I don't know if God loves me. Because what we're asking for is that tickly feeling on the back of the neck. Or that little jump in their heart that they once remembered they had when somebody held their hand and they got a tickly feeling and that romance all started. But love in God's ways is a practical love, a doing love. It's not just a feeling, it's an action. And yet God loved us and he loved us so much. The only problem with what I'm saying is that our ministers, pastors, vicars, who get kind of really upset about this. Because if we tell people how much God loves them and how much grace is given to them and how much kindness and mercy is shown to them, then that's just giving them a license to sin. In fact, Paul had that same argument. When I talk about it, you are already forgiven. To some, that's liberation. That's brilliant. That's amazing. I'm free from all that restraint about the voice of the devil saying, do you remember what you did? But others think, oh, I'm already bigger and I can do what I want. The true child of God wouldn't be like that. <coughs> Knowing that we are loved actually turns us away from sin. It turns us away. Knowing that you are greatly loved means that when it comes to an option of doing something right or wrong, knowing who you are in Christ, knowing how much you are loved and what Jesus did for you, Weighing the cost up, forget it. It's interesting when people start dating, especially when they fall madly in love with each other, how one of them will start doing the things the other person is doing, even if they don't like it. I'm not talking about bad things. I had a girl from years ago, or at least a girl from that I quite fancied, and um, I thought she was all right. So she invited me to come to the orchestra. Now towards me, I wasn't interested in the orchestra at all. I wasn't even interested in that sort of thing. If it wasn't heavy, rock, punk, spike stuff, run around, go crazy, I didn't want to sit there with a lot of people. And then to make it worse, she, we went to the, the, the tea beforehand where everybody had cups and saucers. She gave me a mug. Oh yes. Isn't it brilliant? It's like, I got told I couldn't even wear jeans to go. But I went, because I fancied her. Maybe it didn't last a while anyway. <laughs> but I am curious, I see couples who, who fall mad in love and they get married and, and he'll start doing things that she liked and she'll do things that he liked because they love each other. I have to wonder, does my kids do the things they do because they like doing them, or love doing them, or because I love doing them, or Joe loves doing them. Knowing that you are loved gives you freedom, gives you liberty to be who you are. Sin has no more power over you when you know you're loved. When you know you're loved, it changes everything. And as Christians, we are loved. The second part of this is that God's love is always linked with sacrifice. When somebody loves someone, like I just said, I sacrificed tonight just to go to the orchestra, even though the orchestra wasn't my faith. But it's often linked with sacrifice. In fact, if you read through, especially John's Gospel and John's letters, there's often sacrifice linked with how much God loves us. In the Old Testament, if you look, when somebody sinned and did something wrong, they would often get a sheep, a lamb, and they would bring it to the priest, and the priest would inspect the lamb to see if there were any spots, blemishes, or defects on it. And then the person would kill the lamb, and they would take the blood and put it on the altar and do all the other stuff. But some of that the guy did who actually had sinned and laid his hands on the sheep, 
and impart or impute his sin unto the sheep, and the sheep then would be killed. Old Testament, I know it's a picture of Jesus, but some of we forget in there is that the priest inspected the lamb, not the person. The sheep was the one getting inspected, the sheep had to be perfect, not the person who had done the sin. And yet sometimes we think we need to be perfect when we come before God, before we get saved, we don't have to be. And even getting saved afterwards, we feel we need to live a perfect life. We need to be a life of honouring to God, but we can never be perfect. But God looks at the perfect lamb, the lamb of God. God looks at Jesus being our lamb in our sacrifice, who was without blemish, spot or defect. Yeah, if you think about that, when he was on the cross, there was lots of spots, blemish and defects on him. Because he'd been given a real good beating. But what he was saying is that Jesus never sinned, therefore he could take our sin. And then God looked at him, he looked at him perfectly. And that's when he sees us. In the Old Testament, they investigate the lamb, not the sinner. And yet the devil will try and come at us and tell us that we've been investigated. No, it's Jesus that took it all for us. God loved us and he gave. All of the Bible we read that. He gave himself and bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness as one Peter. Again in one Peter we read this. For Christ also suffered once for sin and just as the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being, <laughs> to God, being put in, the, in death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. Jesus suffered once for sin. He's not going to do it again. It's happened. It's done. That's why I, I can say the statement that our sins are already forgiven. Because he's not going to do it again. He's already done it once and therefore he's carried it forward. And it's already been done. He suffered once for us. And he took us, he, that was of death, and gave us life. Which I'm glad about. He took, and I've done this before, he took everything that was on us and put it on Jesus. And everything that was on Jesus, he put it on us. So he took our sin and put it on Jesus. And he took Jesus' righteousness and put it on us. And people say, well, how can we be the righteous of God in Christ? The biggest question needs to be asked, how can Jesus, a sinless man, carry sin? Well, he did. Because God took yours and mine and put it on him. And then he nailed it to the cross. He took our sicknesses and our diseases. He put it on Jesus and nailed it to the cross. He took the curse and everything that came with the curse, put it on Jesus and nailed it to the cross. And when Jesus died, that was the price paid for everything. The propitiation, putting it across, transferring, or a mathematical term, balancing the equation. He took everything that was wrong, put it on Jesus, and he took everything that was right on Jesus and put it on us. But the good news is, he didn't take what was on Jesus on us and spread it around on everybody, as in, you know, like a cake, we chop it into little pieces. There's probably a billion people on this planet right now. That's a very, in the matter of a pretty big cake. I mean, if you take the blood of Jesus, we reckon we've got eight pints of blood in our body. I mean, that wouldn't even be a tiny drop for everybody. But the truth is, his blood was sufficient to wipe away all sin. His body was sufficiently beaten to take away all sicknesses, to wipe them all out. He did it once and for all, for us all. See, I like this stuff. Yet some people, they need to think about the fact that we love God. Well, the important thing is, not that we love God, but He loved us and gave Himself for us. 1 John 2, 2 says this, And He Himself is our propitiation for our sins, and not just for our sins, but for, also for the whole world. Nobody will be now because of any sin they've committed. Because the sin that they've committed has already been paid for. They'll only be in hell because they rejected what Jesus did for them. On the other side of that, nobody will be in heaven for any good thing they've done. They'll only be in heaven because they accepted what Jesus has done for them. Because it says, not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. Sin has been dealt with. That's the good news. It's been dealt with. 
Get off that alley, you sick ass. It's been dealt with. The only thing that's stopping people going to heaven now is the fact that they won't humble themselves, couldn't call Jesus, and accept what he's done for them. They want to still earn their way. They want to try and love him with all their heart, mind, and soul. They want to try and obey all the Ten Commandments. They want to live a righteous life, but they never can. Yet Jesus did it all for us. It's interesting that before man was even created, God knew what was going to happen. He set a standard so high that man could never achieve. And he says to him, okay, if you want to do it your way, do it this way. This is you've got to get to that level. But then he put a price in place ready to pay that. So he set the contract and paid the price as well. In himself. So we are loved. The Father's love is always linked to his sacrifice. And love is active. It's passionate, not passive. When a kid knows it's loved, if Ethan come running here excited about summer, I would go, oh my son, let's shake hands. He knows he's loved, he then just jumps straight up. He has a hug. We have a thing called the kissy monster. So he comes out every now and then. Usually when I'm tucking him in bed, Joseph, leave him alone. And I give him a mad kiss all over the anyway, he's trying to duck and fight. And it's a bit of a laugh and a joke, but at least he knows he loves the kissing monster. And then I say, oh, he's gone away now for a while, just now I'm asleep. But the truth is, he knows he's loved, I hope though she is. Well, I hope they know that, what I seem to do. When I walk into a room, I don't also stand up to attention. I just carry on. Sometimes they stop doing what we're doing and then it makes me suspicious what we're doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? As a father. But love is passionate, it's not passive. There's a lot more I can get to. I'll just remind everybody that to be pure, everything's pure. So don't take that one too far. But it's passionate. And I think God's looking for passionate people, people with a passion to change things. Jesus in John's Gospel, and again, we'll get to this later on as we work our way through John, we'll, we'll unpack this a bit more. The one thing it says in John 17, Jesus says that he's praying, that I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So Jesus is praying for his disciples, but he's also praying for us as well, further down the line. He's praying for the generations that have been between the disciples and us. I do not pray for those alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. So that through their words, in other words, disciples were going to have to speak something, and then people were going to believe it were going to continue. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. So Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in Jesus. And that they also may be one with us. And that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I give to them. That they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me. Hang on a minute. <coughs> Often people hold God the Father at some great distance. Oh, Father. <coughs> Father. Actually, the terminology is Daddy. But we say, you know, some people say, uh, forget Jesus, I just want to go to the Father. <coughs> Well, actually, Jesus is in the Father, and we are in Jesus, we are getting to the Trinity thing, and the Spirit said as well, but as I am in you, and they are in me, I am in them, and you are in me, and they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. You want to know how much you are loved this morning? You are loved as much as God the Father loved God the Son. He loves you the same. You say that in some circles and they want to stone you. And yet it says, I've loved them as you have loved me. Tell me you, that you are loved. And it's not a passive love. I was going to say it's an aggressive love in the good sense. 
The Father loves you as much as he loved the Son. I've been reading a book recently, I've been to a conference, and it was a good time. But I, I got a book uh, by Colin Dye. And uh, there's a little um, paragraph in here about the Father's heart, and I thought I would just read it out to you. Because if you, if we love God because he loves us, then we ought to be passionate about what he's passionate about. If the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living in us, that same spirit is, as the passionate heart of God is in us. We ought to be passionate about what he's passionate about. Do you think so? Am I talking rubbish? I'm passionate about what Joe's passionate about because I love her. And we ought to be passionate about the things that God is passionate about. And God loves us. But it says this here. If you draw close to the Father's heart, you will discover it is breaking with love for the lost. He is the God of grace and mercy. And there's loads of verses in here, but I'll, I'll skip past the verses and just, you know, read the points. He loves us with, he loved, his love for all humanity led him to send Christ to be the saviour of the world. Judgment is described as a strange and alien works. In other words, it's not normal, it's not the natural side of God. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he is absolutely just and cannot go against his holy nature. If we reject his grace and his way of salvation, we remain under the wrath and his righteous, and his righteous reacts to sin. Jesus died for all humanity and his preaching of the cross draws us to him. That's why the second death breaks God's heart. If we don't, if we, if this doesn't move us with compassion for the lost, nothing will. If we cannot be passionate for the lost souls of men and women and children around us, I wonder whether we can be passionate about anything. Nothing could ever be more important than this. An interesting thing. In other words, if you've got a passion for anything that outweighs your passion for God and his passion for the lost, then you need to ask yourself the question, where's your passion lying? Because I'll, tell, I'll say this, that church for some people is one meeting on a Sunday morning. And if you had all the hours up in a week, that adds up to less than 1% of your week. It's church. Now we are the church. We are the body of Christ. You don't have to come to a building to be church. You can meet in people's houses, you can do that. But if end of the day, if once or twice a week, if you go to church twice a week and then ultimately spend three hours there, that's less than two percent of your week. And yet when somebody's madly in love with somebody else, they will finish work and they will go over to their house, they'll stop late, they'll get to work the next day, they'll, they'll do crazy things, they'll be up all weekend. And yet often I've heard this, that some people say, I had a busy day yesterday, or in garden, so I skipped Sunday. So your garden is more important than meeting together as a body of Christ. Am I alright saying this? You know, I, I had a, a busy week, so I had a load of fun on Saturday going wild, doing my own thing, but Sunday's my day off. Interesting. But passion about what God's passionate about, and God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He doesn't want any, like I said, there's verses there that talk about fact that God, the second death upsets God. Because when somebody dies and has not turned to Jesus, that's it, it's over and done with. When we get to heaven, we will sit down at the Lamb's Supper. So we'll do the communion but on a big scale, full meal. They'll be worshipped 24-7. We can go to God and we can talk about, not just what he said in the Bible, but we can talk to the people that are in the Bible. We can actually stand before God, lay before God, and whatever. The only thing we can't do when we get to heaven is to fight the devil and to win people for God. They're the only two things he can't do. In fact, it's not really us fighting the devil. We just stand our ground, resist the devil, submit to God, we just tell, and he flees. 
And yet I see people with great passion for great things. But God's looking for a generation of people that are passionate about what he's passionate about. People that will be world changers. I was talking to somebody recently and they said, what's, you know, how are you doing? I said, I'll be honest with you, I'm getting tired of little things, putting out little fires all over the place. And this guy said, it's interesting how the devil distracts us. And I thought, yes, the devil will try to contain us, tell you you're not good enough, you'll never do that, or distract us by little things. Well, I need to pay a mortgage, yes you do. I need to honour my boss, yes you do. Be a fantastic Christian at work. But realistically, most of them only work 40, say 48, 50 hours in a week. You've got 168 hours. Yeah, you need some sleep in there as well. But when me and Jill started dating, we were up till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was back at work, you know, 7 o'clock next morning. And I, yeah, I could tell that weekend. <laughs> no, and I know we've got older, we're not a split, but at the end of the day, we should be wiser. We should be a bit wiser on stuff. I want to ask you this, this morning, what's your passion? Because God's, God loves you so much. And what is our passion? Where's your passion? I read a story recently, uh, oh, sorry, a while ago. I've tried to read it again recently, and I hope I get it right from memory. But about a young girl who, um, as she was growing up, her friends at school used to laugh at her, take the mick out of her and joke to her about her mum, because her mum had lots of scars on her body, and she was slightly disfigured. And the, her, her class friends used to um, take a mick and laugh at her. And as she grew up into her early teens and went to high school, people used to laugh and joke about her mum, and to that point at her mum, because she was scarred and disfigured. And it became such a problem that her mum became an embarrassment to her in her teens. To the point where she almost disowned them all, like teens sometimes do. But then one day, her mum sat her down and I talked to her about why she's scarred and disfigured. And she told the girl that when she was young as a baby, there was a big fire. And she wrapped her daughter up in a blanket, ran through the flames on fire herself, got trapped, and, and things fell on her. And she got the baby out even though she was on fire. She survived. The scars and the disfigurement is from all the operations that she had there after. Trying to reconstruct parts of the body, put together in a certain way. From that point onwards, that little girl was never embarrassed about her mum. She never disowned her mum. In fact, she stood up for her mum. She held her mum up as a shining example of sacrifice. And she couldn't care what anybody else said about her. And yet for many people, when we talk about the name Jesus, to some it's an embarrassment. <clears throat> to some it's almost, well, I don't have to be proactive, I'll just hide away from that one. Jesus, the name Jesus, is becoming more and more unpopular. God is not. They can talk God with anybody. He can debate God. You mention Jesus, and oh, you're on a different level playing, you're on a different field there. People do not want to talk about Jesus. And without criticising some of the songs, there's a, a pulling back to calling God Yahweh, and that's his name. Yahweh means covenant keeping God. But there's power in the name of Jesus. And there's a steady erosion of the name of Jesus. We'll call him God now. Yes, he is God. But we'll just, we don't mention Jesus that much. It's about Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus, demons fly. Not in the name of the Lord. Not in the name of God. But in the name of Jesus. Yeah? Yeah? It's in the name of Jesus. 
God loves us so much. And I'm going to, over the next few weeks, months, I'm looking for people who have a passion for Jesus to rise up, to stand up. I'm not going to tell you what for, and I won't do until you commit. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? <laughs> Did Jesus tell his disciples what we're getting into before we're going to it? No, but he just says, follow me. Come on, I'll show you. But seriously, God stirred up in me a passion. And you can see what we saw a little bit last week. It's not a song and a dance, but it's a passion to continue through adversities. To stand up and say yes. To pray bold prayers in faith, believing that God will answer our prayers. To stand up and start to prophesy over situations just with a little fire in our bellies. I think the church as a whole has just relaxed, chilled out, and we're sailing towards the end, thinking we hope Jesus returns before it gets too hard. And yet Jesus has got a passion for everybody that's lost. And that includes the neighbour that annoys you so much, the car driving in front of you that waves at you impolitely. All these people that you don't get on with, God loves them as much as they love you and cares for you. God's got a, a place for them like he has for you. The question is, do we share God's passion? Do we share his heart? I'm not saying we all wear t-shirts saying I'm a Christian, but there's some weird people around. And they usually wear the t-shirt saying I am. Job 316 on the back and someone else on the front, you know, or whatever. And I'm not rubbishing those things if that's what you like. But people have a passion. I want to pray people into the kingdom. But it's interesting how many times we pray this prayer, God send them in. God never said send them in. He says you go get them. That prayer... I don't, also, I don't just pray for these people, but pray for them who will believe their words. Their words are words of witness and encouragement that lead people to Jesus. So he's praying generationally down the line. If you've got a passion for anything, then you need to just weigh up where that passion lies. Whatever it might be. I like Lego, technique especially. Christmas presents, secret Santa, we do all that stuff again. <laughs> I like climbing. I love hiking. I love just knocking around getting mucky sometimes, rolling in mud with kids. I love that side of stuff. But put that all aside. My heart for God is greater or further down the line. And I want to get to know the Father's heart. But in knowing the Father's heart, I know that I will fall in love with what he loves. And what he loves is the unsaved. The question now is, am I prepared to do that? And I'm not talking about we need to witness. No, we do not need to witness. We need to be a witness. We don't need evangelism. We need to shine Jesus. We are the church. And we're not called to be witnesses, we're called to witness, to shine. So if you're curious, I put men, that includes women, and I look for people who are passionate about Jesus, who are prepared to stir up and explore that passion inside them for God. Laying aside the silly little things that stop us the little things that we become, that we like. People are prepared. You could say people are prepared to fast. People are prepared to pray. People are prepared to get passionate about Jesus. God got passionate about us and he sent his son. And that's what the table reminds us every time. You know what, if you don't get passionate for, for anything to do with God, other than you've got saved, you'll still go to heaven. You're still forgiven. But I figure I might have 60 years left on this planet, given I'm 45. And I want to burn out the end with passion. To just, I, don't want to, I don't want to fade out. I want to go out in style. It's interesting that 
In the 1900s, they used to put newspaper articles asking people to come on expeditions around the world. Possibility of success zero, or, well, almost zero, and people would sign up for it. NASA mentioned about people going to Mars. One way trip, you will get there and you will die. The applications are phenomenal because built into everyone, especially men, is something that we want to make our lives worth something, that counts for something. And that's not rubbish in women because you are designed differently and with a specific purpose as well. But there's so many men that will go into battle and fight knowing that they could die. The problem is that over the last 50 years, as this mellowness come into the church, passiveness has come into society, and people don't want to do it anymore. There's still a few people that want to live and die like a hero. The problem with heroes is they often die young. I'm not planning on dying young. I'm planning on living a full life. But I want to get there at the end, full. God stirred this summer up in me, especially over the last couple of months. And I don't know when this is going to take me at all. I don't know where it's going to. But I'm excited to find out. The more I get into God's Word, the more I see how He's drawing me closer and closer to Him. And salvation is a totally free gift, but it could cost you everything. And now I appreciate sometimes you think you're paying everything. Only to realise is drawing a bit closer. And I'm not talking, I get away from this idea that God's always going to send us off somewhere we never want to go. Or we've got to give our firstborn. Or we've got to give up this all, give up that. Unless God really inspires you to do that, that's not what God's heart is. God will always draw you with something better than what you've got. I'm about done. I don't want to really continue, but I will say this. Talk to God about some stuff. Ask Him, is there times in your life where you were really passionate and on fire? Can you use those terms for it. Where you would literally, you know, you were the first at the door when the church opened. You were the last one when we kicked you out. You know, when you loved worship, and I know I'm not a great style of worship, you know what I mean, I'm not bouncing around, but you may have been like that. Where you couldn't wait to meet somebody to tell them about Jesus. You couldn't wait to get into the Bible and read a little bit more. You couldn't wait for those quiet times when you could pray. But now it's become almost like a dysfunctional marriage where God walks in and you nip to the computer room and he comes into the computer room and you go down and switch the TV on. Like a marriage that's living in the same house but, but in different rooms where dinner's made but it's getting on its own. If you look back and you think, you know, I used to be really passionate about that. <coughs> And I know we mature, and I know we grow, <laughs> but fire's fire. Passion's passion. I love it, you know, when I just get a chance to witness to somebody, it like it explodes because I just love doing it. And it's not grown cold, I love preaching. I love doing certain things, even though I can't climb like I once did, I still love doing it. Because the passion's still there. And you can see sometimes in people's eyes when something happens and that passion starts to come back. It's like parents who have kids and their kids grow up and it seems their passion for their kids is lost. And then the grandkids come along and it comes back alive. Sometimes it fades for a while. But I'm going to ask you to stir it up. That passion for God. Stir it up. And I will say this. Yes, you have been hurt. Yes, you have been damaged. But it was never from God. Yes, people have mocked you. People have ridiculed you. They did that to my son, says God. They ripped his flesh off his back, nailed him to a cross. God's not asking us to do that. 
unless you feel cold to North Korea or something like that. <laughs> the truth is, compared to the love that God poured out on us, when we remember the table and we come before him, our passion, we ought to be for him and for what he's passionate about. My passions for prayer, you know, we should be praying all the time. My passions for worship, we should be living a life of worship, a life of witness. So, amen. <coughs> Next couple of weeks, if you're thinking, I'm going to put it on about Johnny when you talk about men of passion, women of passion. But if you want to go for something, <laughs> if you want to go for it, it scares me, but let's go for it anyway. Let's do it. Let me just pray. We're not going to sing a song. Um, sorry, Steve. I'm not going to go to your choice of songs, by the way. Or um, anybody else that brings songs. Let me just pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you, Lord, that you love us so much. And Lord, that you are in Jesus and that we are in Jesus. In fact, Lord, I thank you that you say that we are, we are seated in heavenly realms. Lord, in the spirit, Lord, we are right there with you. Lord, I thank you for everybody in this room. Lord, I thank you that you really do love us. Lord, I pray for... Lord, not the knowledge of your love, but I do pray for the experience of feeling and knowing your love for people. For, Lord, let your love just fall upon us in a tangible way that we may, Lord, just feel it as well. Lord, I know faith isn't feelings. Lord, but I pray that you'll just stir up a passion in all our hearts for you. Lord, I thank you that we all, you know, we love you. Lord, there are hearts in here, Lord, that have served you for many years. People that have been there and done it, as it were, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will stir up a passion in all of us. Lord, that you'll put a fire in our bellies. Lord, just to be passionate about what you're passionate about. And I pray, Lord, that you will continue speaking to all our hearts. Lord, I pray in this room that you will raise up men and women of God that will lay hands on the sick and see them healed. Lord, that you will raise up men and women who will prophesy what you are going to do. Lord, that you'll speak over people's lives and miracles will happen. Lord, I pray that you'll just raise up people, men and women of God, that will turn the tide of secularism in our country. Lord, people that will stand tall and be a shining beacon to you. People that will get into the gutter and love the unlovely. Lord, people that will stand alongside the smart. Lord, and show them the grace of God. Lord, raise up people that can shine beyond everything else. Lord, we speak of this church and let it be a beacon of light that shines in this dark area, that will draw people towards you and help us, Lord, to go out and bring those people in. Lord God, we pray that you will just continue to bless like you promised you will. But help us to realise that we can only love you because you first loved us. Lord, that we can bless because you've already blessed us. That we can shine because you already shine upon us. Lord, I pray that you will just stir in our hearts a passion for you. I thank you for everything you've done in all our lives. Everything that's happened, Lord. All the great and good things that you've done. But Lord, I pray that the next year, the next 10 years, the next months, you whisper to us that we've not seen anything yet. That you'll do amazing things in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, God, I pray that you've not forgotten your promises that you've said over this church before. Lord, that you'll stir them up again. And let us be men and women of faith that stand on your promises, refusing to be removed, ref refusing to get sidelined by little things, that stand tall, knowing that you're doing a work in this area. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you're doing. Amen. 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 Amen.